Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Nature in Your Classroom Exploring an Urban Wilderness live stream. We are so excited to be here with you today for our first Nature in Your Classroom live stream of this school year. So my name is Jasmine. I'm going to be one of your hosts for this afternoon. And I'm Raya, and I'll meet you a little bit later. Jasmine's going to take over for the beginning, but it's so great to be joining you today and having you join us. Awesome. Thanks so much, Raya. So Raya and I both work for the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. You can see that on my deck in here. Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, also known as TRCA. The most important word in our big name is conservation. So here at TRCA, we do many things to help protect and take care of the environment. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is through education. So through what we're doing now, we encourage people to get outside um, and learn about nature. Um, today's live stream is also part of the Naturehood program, which is a program hosted by Nature Canada. And Naturehood is all about encouraging people to connect with nearby nature right in their neighborhood. So that's where that word Naturehood comes from. And today we're going to be encouraging you to explore an urban wilderness and one urban wilderness in particular, which is where Ryan and I both are today. That urban wilderness is called Tommy Thompson Park. It is such a wonderful space and a space that all of us here at TRCA love. And today we're going to be telling you so many things about it. We're going to tell you how to actually visit Tommy Thompson Park. We're going to share a little bit about the history of this space because it has a pretty interesting history. We're also going to share with you some of our favorite locations here at Tommy Thompson Park and some of the wildlife that we can find here in these specific ecosystems. We're going to be talking about some of the interactions that take between the wildlife that live here. Um, and we're also going to be talking about how humans interact with this space as well. So a note for everyone who's joining us on YouTube, if you are logged into YouTube, then you can access the chat, which is fantastic. Please feel free to throw any comments in there. If you have any questions for us, we'll be answering questions at the end of the live stream. So stick around to the end to hear um, answers to your questions. And just a reminder to everyone to make sure to keep all of your comments and questions in the chat on topic and focused to this live stream. We also have a worksheet associated with this live stream. We'll be posting the link to that worksheet in the chat if you're interested in downloading it and filling it out as a part of today's live stream. And we can throw up a picture of what that worksheet looks like if you're interested in downloading it as well. All right. So um, <laughs> today I want to introduce to you all of the people that are helping out with this live stream. Well, only some of them. There are many people helping out, but I'm going to introduce myself first. So I told you my name, Jasmine, but I also want to share with you one of my favorite memories of Tommy Thompson Park as a way for you to get to know me and get to know this space a little bit. My favorite memory of Tommy Thompson Park is on a really windy day. And I think this was a few years ago and I was down on the shoreline of Tommy Thompson Park. We're going to share this a little bit later, but Tommy Thompson Park is actually surrounded on three different sides by Lake Ontario. And you can actually see Lake Ontario far in the distance behind me. Um, I was down on the shoreline of Lake Ontario and it was a really windy day and the waves were just massive and they were crashing up onto the rocks along the shore. And it made me realize, you know, how powerful Lake Ontario is, how big it is. And I just felt really grateful to be outside. Um, Raya, I'm gonna pass it over to you to share your favorite memory of Tommy Thompson Park. Yes, thank you, Jasmine. And as you can tell, Tommy Thompson Park, it's, while it's like minutes away from downtown Toronto, it's remote enough that sometimes there are cell issues here. So if either of us are a little choppy, then that's the reason why the reception just isn't the, the best here, which is kind of a cool feeling to like get away, right? When you um, don't have that reception all the time necessarily. So favorite memory for me, there are so many to choose from, but one of them that stands out is, um, I used to run a young birders club here. And when me and a couple of other, um, a couple of the participants, the youth that were birding, I don't know if you saw that blue jay fly past right now, um, we were towards the very end of the peninsula and we encountered these beautiful long milk snakes. And it was just this quiet moment where the milk snakes were, there was, we thought there was one and then there were two. We, um, they were moving through the grass. They didn't really notice us. We weren't moving much. We were staying really quiet. And we just got to watch them and 
you know, take it all in. And it was really amazing. I still remember, like I get shivers when I think about how amazing it was to witness um, that movement, that casual, calm movement of the snakes. So that's one of my favorite moments at Tommy Thompson Park. Now, Sarah, Jasmine mentioned there are people in the back end. We've got people who are helping with the chat and Sarah is helping with the tech. And Sarah has been um, at Tommy Thompson Park a lot as well. She's been working here and spending time here. So Sarah, can you share one of your uh, top memories of Tommy Thompson Park? So one of my favorite memories from Tommy Thompson Park is walking down the main road at Tommy Thompson Park and watching the beautiful monarch butterflies flying across the road to the different flowers on either side. Oh, so special, those monarch butterflies, especially this time of year when they're just heading out to Mexico, but sometimes they gather here before they make their way out, as you can see in the background photo of the live stream. <laughs> we have so many things to talk about today. Um, and the first thing that we're going to talk about is how you actually can visit Tommy Thompson Park. So how to actually get here. Raya, why don't you share how we can visit this park? Yes, absolutely. So there are a few different ways to get to Tommy Thompson Park. And we'll be putting a link in the chat for that directs you to our website where it says like how you can get here. If you scroll down, there is uh, different ways to arrive here. Um, I One of the ways that I sometimes come to Tommy Thompson Park is by TTC. So it is TTC accessible. And you can see in this clip um, that it's the Jones 83 bus, which comes from Donlin Station on the Bloor Danforth line and makes its way down. Um, the entrance to the park is about maybe five or eight minutes a walk from the closest bus stop. So walking down Leslie, it feels like an industrial space for a while, but there are some uh, shrubs and things like that at some points. And as you approach the entrance of the park, um, then you can see that there's the Tommy Thompson Park sign. And you just have to be mindful that um, just before the park, there is a trail, it's a multi-use trail called the Martin Goodman Trail for pedestrians and cyclists. So I always like to have a quick look to see any, if any cyclists are coming um, from either direction. And, um, and then I'll make my way towards the pavilion. Oh, there's a cyclist there. So the pavilion is this brand new entrance building. We just uh, actually it was built like last year, a year and a half ago. Um, and it's right next to the parking lot. So if you are driving, you can park there for free as well. And then around the corner of the pavilion. So there's the park in the distance um, and it goes, like I said, five kilometers into Lake Ontario, but just around the corner, there is a map. And so you can kind of get your bearings. I like to take a picture of the map before I head in. It's also on the back of the worksheet if you have a worksheet. And we are right now on the very left of the map um, at the entrance and you could make your way all the way in, whether walking or biking or what have you, um, to the very tip if you're interested. Another way to get in is by biking. So this is Jasmine. She almost always bikes to Tommy Thompson Park, takes the Martin Goodman Trail, bikes into the bike trail of the park, and makes her way in to the interior of Tommy Thompson Park. So there are different ways to get here. It's a great accessible park, which is really wonderful as far as arriving to the park. Yeah. But I know Jasmine has some more to share with us about Tommy Thompson Park. So <laughs> I'm going to bring her back on. <laughs> I do, and I love biking to Tommy Thompson Park. It's my favorite way to get here, and I always take the Martin Goodman Trail, which is this fantastic bike trail that spans from the west end of Toronto all the way to the east end, which is where Tommy Thompson Park is located. So I want to show you on a map kind of where to find Tommy Thompson Park in the context of the rest of the city. So here we can see a map of Toronto and the GTA. We can see the Toronto Islands there stretching out into Lake Ontario. And then on the right hand side on the east end of Toronto is where we can see Tommy Thompson Park in that big red circle. So Tommy Thompson Park is a peninsula. It is connected to land by a tiny piece there that you can see. And it stretches all the way out into Lake Ontario for five kilometers out into the lake. Um, what's really interesting and really unique about this space is that Tommy Thompson Park has not always been here. So Tommy Thompson Park actually began being built in 1959. And I think we can go to the next picture here. Um, so you can see this is kind of a history of the lake filling of Tommy Thompson Park. And you can see how bit by bit, starting from the city and moving its way out into Lake Ontario, Tommy Thompson Park began being constructed. And that kind of footprint was built up over time. And the construction materials that were used to build Tommy Thompson Park ranged dramatically. 
Um, and so if we go into the next picture, I think we can see Tommy Thompson Park actually being constructed. And so you can see it's kind of a pile of rubble and dirt. Um, a lot of construction debris from the city was actually brought over on big trucks and dumped here. Um, and what's really interesting is when you visit Tommy Thompson Park, you can actually see some of those bricks and those rebar and those large kind of rocks. And that's what makes up the base and the footprint of Tommy Thompson Park, especially along the shorelines is where you can see that kind of exposed. Um, so originally Tommy Thompson Park just kind of looked like this, this tiny little spit, um, Leslie Street spit, as it was called back in the day, stretching out into Lake Ontario. Um, a lot of rubble, a lot of bricks, not a lot going on. But over time, of course, environmental succession or ecological succession happened. So seeds started to blow over from the city, trees started to grow, smaller plants started to grow. Um, and once there are flora here growing at Tommy Thompson Park, then the fauna followed, right? So we had animals coming down from the city. We had animals swimming over from the Toronto Islands or flying over and resting here. And the biodiversity of this space just grew and grew and grew. Um, eventually, in the 1970s, is when we realized that Tommy Thompson Park was a really unique space. We were noticing huge numbers of migratory birds using this as a stopover point on their migration. And we noticed a number of different mammals, amphibians, reptiles, insects, also living here and using this space as their kind of primary ecosystem and habitat. Um, and so in the 1970s is when TRCA got involved um, and started looking towards the future of Tommy Thompson Park. And so what was created was the TTP, short form for Tommy Thompson Park, Master Plan. And this was created by TRCA, as well as a number of other stakeholders. There were four main objectives of this master plan. And these are preserving significant species, protecting environmentally significant areas, enhancing aquatic and terrestrial habitats, and enhancing public recreational opportunities. So if you look at these four main objectives, you'll notice that the first three of them are really focused around the ecological health of Tommy Thompson Park. So ensuring that the flora and fauna that live here at Tommy Thompson Park are supported um, and ensuring that we're also working to continuously improve the ecosystems um, that exist here as well. But then that last objective of the master plan is to enhance public recreational opportunities. So we also want to make sure that Tommy Thompson Park is a space where humans can come and interact with the environment and connect with nature. Um, and that could be just visiting with your family, going for a bike ride or coming on a school trip or even coming on a virtual kind of field trip like we're doing today. If we go to the last picture, I think that will show us what Tommy Thompson Park looks like today. So here we can see the uh, kind of footprint of Tommy Thompson Park as it exists in Lake Ontario. You can see that's a lot of square footage. That's a really big park and it supports a huge number of different wildlife and different creatures, different organisms that live here. So we've talked a little bit about how to get to Tommy Thompson Park and we've given you some context, taking you back in time and talking about, talked about the history of Tommy Thompson Park as well. My friends, I have a question for all of you. Have you been to Tommy Thompson Park before? If you have, I would love for you to put it in the chat so that we can get a sense of who's visited. Maybe you've heard of Tommy Thompson Park, but you've never come. Um, let us know. We'd love to know. Now, I'd love for us to share some of our favorite spots at Tommy Thompson Park. So Raya and I are both at different locations here in the park, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about them. Raya, where are you at right now? Yes, so I am at, I'm actually on the roof of a structure called the Outdoor Classroom. So if, you've, if you have ever been here on a field trip, then you might have been underneath this roof. <laughs> it's kind of an open air bunker, not bunker, but it's an open air space um, with a long bench in it and it's got a cover. So if you look behind me, you can see there's a railing here and we're going to show you a picture a little later. You can kind of get a different reference point for it. And we've, I've got meadow ecosystems around me for the most part. We can see some forest spaces in the distance a little bit, but mostly it's meadow here with a wetland in the distance as well. And I wanted to share with you some of the, actually I'm going to share with you first where in Tommy Thompson Park this outdoor classroom is. So Sarah, if we can pull up the picture of the map that shows um, the outdoor classroom, you can see it's circled there. So it's a couple of kilometers into the park. 
a little bit of a walk. And it's right at the north end. North on this map happens to be to the left. To the, uh, your left, my right, I'm not sure. It's <laughs> towards the city end. Um, and yeah, so it's right at the top of this first wetland space here at Tommy Thompson Park, which is called the Cell One Wetland. Very interesting name. Yes, I know. But this has a history too, which we won't get into today. So I want to share with you some of the organisms who make use of this meadow space in this area and even the wetland space there. So this is a picture from down below behind where I'm pointing and you can see the railing at the top and that's where I am right now. Um, but you can also see that open space where the classroom is. Now underneath the overhang there, there are nests. If you come to Tommy Thompson Park right now today, you'll see like 20 of these barn swallow nests. So barn swallow is one of the types of swallows here and you can see the babies waiting in that nest to be fed and then their parents will come in, they'll catch insects on the fly, fly in there and feed their young. So there's these insects that live in the meadow that the parents and the young rely on for their food. This is now a cliff swallow nest. So the nest is actually attached to the ceiling. This is at a different location, but it's a video to show how the adult can actually come in and feed their young really, really quickly and off they go to get more. Let's watch that again because it was so fast. So the adult comes in, swoops in, and the video might have stalled a little bit or maybe that's just on my end, um, but they swoop in, feed their young really quickly. Swallows eat insects. So they are known as aerial insectivores. There it goes, <laughs> there she goes. And um, this means they're catching insects on the fly and bringing those insects to their young to feed. This is now a tree swallow. So they don't nest in those mud nests that the swallows build. These tree swallows actually look for holes in trees. We call these tree cavities. So they rely on dead or dying trees to actually have holes, um, to actually have the nests in them. And again, feeding their young on the fly and then flying off and now the young is satiated and content, right? So these are three different types of swallows who live at Tommy Thompson Park and there are even more. Now, when we're thinking about insects, here's an example of an insect. This is a teeny tiny caterpillar. This is a monarch caterpillar by chance. Um, and as they grow and grow, they need a lot to eat. So we're getting into these interactions more of these ecosystems, right, within the ecosystems. They need so much vegetation so that they can actually grow. And once they grow, um, Sometimes it's a younger state, sometimes it's the older state when they might be eaten by predators. Here's another example of a predator that relies on not only insects now, but also fish. This is a great blue heron, and I believe I saw one just a moment ago in this wetland. And the great blue heron we see pretty frequently, but in this video, you can see that there's a different type of heron. Tommy Thompson Park has this amazing um, diversity of ecosystems and landscapes. So we actually end up the park ends up attracting some rarities every once in a while. This tricolored heron is one we do not usually see in Ontario. This video was taken a few years ago, and this heron is hunting for food. And there'll be a link in the chat to how you can find out more about these different bird species. The tricolored heron specifically, you can go to the range map from the link to allaboutbirds.org, which is a great source for bird info, and check out the range map. The range map does not include Ontario. Watching this bird hunt, oh, there's an egret that flew by. Um, watching the bird hunt, we can see them opening their wings. And um, there are theories behind why they're doing this. Maybe they're trying to create a shadow for fish to come into, and then they can nab the fish. So it's a, a different hunting strategy from how the great blue heron hunts, which is very still. And once they see movement, then they nab the prey. For, they might eat fish, turtles, frogs, all kinds of different organisms. So these are some of the... Um, organisms who really need these meadow ecosystems and perhaps wetland ecosystems. And sometimes these different ecosystems actually work hand in hand. And um, that's really important to recognize as well is that we have different ecosystems here, but the organisms who live here, they could maybe rely on just one, but often they benefit from having more than one present. Jasmine, where are you right now? And what can you share with us about who might be found where you are? Thank you so much, Raya. And I love the outdoor classroom. I feel like it's a perfect example of humans interacting with wildlife. That building was created for humans and it helps humans, but we can see that wildlife like barn swallows are also benefiting from it as well. So cool. Okay, so I am here at the Embayment D Lookout um, and I'll show you on the map where we are as well. So I'm a little bit further down the road from Raya. Raya's at the outdoor classroom there and I'm just a little bit further down um, and I'm standing on a lookout point, but behind me is the Embayment D wetland. 
Um, to the left of me over here, <laughs> my left, is actually a forest ecosystem as well. So you can see some trees in the background. And this stretches all the way along um, down at Tommy Thompson Park as well into that little trail that you can see going along there. Um, so Embayment D is a really unique space because we're situated here between this wetland and between this forest um, ecosystem. And I wanna share a little bit more about some of the wildlife that live in this area. Also really cool, you can see the city of Toronto behind me, you can see the CN Tower right there. So it gives you a sense of how urban this um, wilderness actually is, right? When we're so close to downtown Toronto. All right, so some of the organisms that we can find here, and I wanna start kind of with some of the organisms that we might find in more of a forest ecosystem. One of them is, or a group of them are snakes. And so snakes are a creature that we often see here at Tommy Thompson Park. This image here is of a garter snake and garter snakes are one of the most common snakes that we can find here at Tommy Thompson Park. This time of year is actually an amazing time to spot snakes. As the weather gets colder, you can see I'm in a jacket today, as I'm sure many of you wore as well. Um, snakes need to rely on external heat in order to warm their bodies. So especially on cold days like this, if the sun comes out, that's when you can find snakes um, out in the open, sitting in the sun and basking to warm up. So if you visit Tommy Thompson Park, there is a pretty good chance that you might get the opportunity to see a snake. Um, while we see a lot of garter snakes, there are actually a few other species of snakes that live here as well. Um, and the next species that I want to share with you is called a milk snake. So here we can see a juvenile milk snake. When they're young, they can be pretty small. But here in this video, we can see um, an adult milk snake. And I think there's actually two milk snakes in this video, which is so cool. Um, it's so rare to see one of them, let alone two together. And I think this is the video that Raya was talking about earlier from her favorite memory. Um, and so we can see how large they actually get. Um, as they're living in their ecosystems and eating all of the resources um, that they can find. So cool and so special to get an up-close view of some of these organisms. All right, so this video, in here we can see a dragonfly, and that dragonfly is actually chomping away on a damselfly in this video. So dragonflies are insectivores. We can often find them, especially around wetland ecosystems like this one, because they spend the first part of their life in the water. Um, and if we go back to the dragonfly for a moment, um, dragonflies are uh, kind of like predators in the insect world. So they'll often find smaller insects to eat. And this is a great example of an interaction between two insects, um, kind of a predator prey relationship where one insect is finding the food it needs um, and is supported by the wetland ecosystem that we're living in. Now, if we're talking about wetlands and aquatic ecosystems, the perfect animal to talk about is the mink, which you just caught a glimpse of. And we can go back to that one. This is a capture of a mink taken here at Tommy Thompson Park in the winter. And that mink has just feasted on a little uh, fish that it caught through the ice. Uh, minks are quite small creatures. They have really long bodies and, and pretty long tails as well, um, but they're actually pretty ferocious. So they're really good at hunting. They're really good at swimming down and diving and catching fish. Sometimes they'll catch small rodents as well if they're found in more of a meadow um, habitat or ecosystem. Um, and in this next clip, we can actually see a mink feasting on a huge fish. So this is likely a fish that had washed up along the shoreline, but it's really cool to see this mink in action um, and see them kind of interacting with other species that live in their ecosystem, um, especially like uh, species that would live in a wetland ecosystem like in Bayman D. Awesome, okay. So we've talked about the outdoor classroom and we've talked about Embayment D, just two kind of locations here at Tommy Thompson Park and some of the wildlife that live here. But I wanna pass it over to Raya now to share uh, one of my favorite locations here at Tommy Thompson Park. Yes, okay. Um, so I'm gonna get into that in just a moment, but I wanted to mention, maybe you've noticed that Jasmine and I have been going back and forth a little bit about referring to wildlife as who, or, or that, or it, right? Um, and it's something that I know for me, I'm really working on trying to um, 
change my language a little bit to say who, especially right now as we're getting closer to September 30th, but really all the time and um, September 30th being Truth and Reconciliation Day. So I'm really trying to focus on my connection to the land and the other organisms who live on this planet and share it with me. And so um, I encourage you, if you hear us say who, we're referring to these non-human animals who have instincts and a lot of them, I don't know for a fact that insects have emotions, but a lot of them would ha have emotions, right? You're, if you have a pet dog, they have emotions. And so rather than saying it, see if you can catch us saying who. I'm still working on making sure that's part of how I speak about wildlife. Now, um, when it comes to that other space that Jasmine is mentioning, it's a space called Goldfish Pond. And I will share as well, if you have any questions, again, if you've just joined us, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We will have a question period at the end so we can uh, get to your questions at that point. So Goldfish Pond, you can see on the map, it's quite a bit further into the park. And um, the name Goldfish Pond is a little bit of a funny name for it because goldfish are not even a native species, but it got that name a long time ago and it stuck. It's this little secret hideaway. So you can just show the video, Sarah, of how to get to Goldfish Pond. As you are biking or walking in Tommy Thompson Park, most of the multi-use trail looks like this. So you're walking or biking along and there's a point where it seems like it ends. It does continue, but you have to go over a bridge. So the access to this bridge is on the left-hand side at this point. And this is a pedestrian bridge. It's a floating bridge. Sometimes it's open so that boats can come through because there are, there's authorized work by the Port Authority. Um, so some of their official vehicles are able to go through and do some of the work in um, some of these open spaces. But as you're walking across, if it's open to pedestrians, you can check out the typical city skyline um, as you're making your way to the other side. And then a few hundred meters on the other side, there's a little trail. It's not marked, but there's a little side trail that is on the map. So you have to have your map with you to find it. And if you make your way down that short trail, then you'll find a very small clearing, which looks out over Goldfish Pond. And Goldfish Pond itself, I know the video is a little unclear, but you can see that it looks like just a green surface. It's actually covered in this tiny, tiny plant called duckweed. And there I am looking at the duckweed. And, <laughs> um, and there's another path to get down to ground, like a pond level, get down below. And this tiny plant of duckweed is covering the surface of the pond at the moment, different seasons, different coverage. Um, but often on a sunny day in the fall, you might spot turtles there, turtles on the logs as we speak. And there are lots of other organisms too. Let's back up. This is an example of an aquatic, um, kind of aquatic sample. And there are so many little critters who live in the water that we often don't think about. These we can refer to as macro invertebrates. So they're insects and other types of little critters that don't have a backbone, they're invertebrates. And they're living um, in these aquatic environments, in these aquatic ecosystems. And one example is the water boatman. They look like they have two paddles, right, <laughs> swimming around. There are also, this is a damselfly nymph. So damselflies are similar to dragonflies. They're both in the same order. Of, they're both odonates. And the nymph, they live most of their life in the water, these dam, dragon, dragonflies and damselflies, and then fly out as adults. Here we can see there's actually a crayfish. You can see other things swimming around too, but there's a crayfish at the bottom there, which isn't really considered a macroinvertebrate exactly, but um, it is very cool to find in our aquatic environments here. If you look carefully, you might be able to spot a frog in this scene. Um, there's duckweed ever, oh, and the frog disappeared under the water. It got a little bit disturbed. So one of the other organisms that we, that live, who live at Tommy Don's Park are these frogs. And Sarah, if you freeze on this, I wonder if we can see it more clearly for just a moment. So this is a leopard frog. In Ontario, there are 13 different species of native frog species who live here. And the leopard frog is one of the ones that I see most often at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, and they're just so amazing to see. They are prey of organisms, but they are also predators of other organisms. So if we move forward in the video, we'll get to another um, creature who lives at Tommy Thompson Park. And this next creature is the turtle. This one is a snapping turtle. It's it. They, he or she, is still in their shell. Look at that. This little tiny snapping turtle. You might be able to see the ant crawling over him or her, um, just to get a sense of size. 
we don't usually dig holes and look at them hatch, but we had a wildlife biologist who was doing some research and happened to be at the right place at the right time. I was able to get that video while they were doing the research there. Um, and then the snapping turtles, once they hatch, have to make their way to the water's edge and the wetlands are so important for this. So they crawl into the wetland and the snapping turtle is covered in the mud that was on their back from when they crawled out of that hole. And after many years, they will actually get to this size where they're crawling around looking for prey or looking for a place to nest perhaps. And they're quite large and muscly and just these amazing creatures. Oh my goodness. I love turtles. I love all these organisms. Um, spiders, especially we didn't talk, we're not talking about spiders today, but they are amazing. Um, but these turtles, they're just so, there's something so almost archaic about them and how their body is designed and functions that uh, it's really exciting to spot turtles, even at a distance basking in the sun with their heads up. Whew. All right. Now, when it comes to all these organisms who live at Tommy Thompson Park, including the plants, which we're not getting into today, but as you can see, there are so many different plants, um, plant species growing here, aquatic plants and terrestrial plants, meaning on land. Well, how does it all, how do we maintain this space sustainably, right? The sustainability of ecosystems can be very um, fragile in a way, and with a lot of human activity, it can kind of sometimes destroy what's going on in the natural world and really interrupt it. So Jasmine is going to share some of what we at TRCA do in order to help ensure that there is a good equilibrium between um, the wildlife who live here and the human visitors who visit the home of this wildlife. So Jasmine, if you'd like to share, that'd be fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Raya. Um, so if you remember back to the master plan that I showed you kind of at the beginning of this live stream, we talked a lot about protecting and preserving, but we also talked about enhancing, specifically enhancing aquatic and terrestrial habitats. And so there are very few ecosystems or natural spaces in the world today that have not been affected or impacted by humans in some way, whether it be by pollution or climate change or any other number of factors. But Tommy Thompson Park especially is such a unique space because it was human made, right? It was created by humans. And so it almost feels like we have more obligation to kind of make sure that the natural su succession of this area um, and the way that these ecosystems are evolving um, is happening, like Raya said, in equilibrium and that all of these interactions taking place are amounting to a healthy and balanced natural space. And so there are many projects that our teams here at TRCA, specifically at Tommy Thompson Park, work on in order to fulfill that one goal of the master plan, that goal of enhancing aquatic and terrestrial habitats. One of these projects is one that you can actually see behind me. And so let me see if I can point to it. It is right here. And so it doesn't look like that much from where I'm standing. And certainly this time of year, there's not a lot of activity going on. But if you came a few months ago in the summer, or if you visit again next spring and summer, these little rafts floating in the wetland are actually alive um, with creatures. Um, and so we can play a little bit of a video now to get you a sense of which creatures are using these rafts. So here at Tommy Thompson Park, we call these turn rafts, and that's because they are used by common turns. We can see them all flying over. Let's pause at this photo for a moment, um, and I want to talk a little bit more about the design of the turn raft. So common turns will only nest on islands or pieces of land that are surrounded by water. And everyone who's tuning in in the chat, I want you to think about who or why common terns would only want to nest on islands. You can think about it in your head or even type it in the chat if you'd like to. Um, if you said predators, you are correct. So common terns will nest on islands because that's where they feel the most protected from many of the terrestrial based um, organisms that might like to eat especially their eggs or the chicks once they hatch. And these can involve snakes like the ones I showed earlier or even minks as well. Um, so what we've done here at TRCA is we've provided some specific nesting habitat for these common terns. Um, so we've made them to float in the wetland and you can also see there's this kind of lift lip around the, the raft where it kind of points out 
And that's because of one specific predator, and that is the mink. So minks, like I mentioned before, are wonderful at swimming, and they're pretty intelligent as well. So minks figured out that they could swim through the wetland, climb on up over that raft, and actually snatch those eggs and snatch those chicks um, quite easily. So we added in these kind of baffles or these kind of rims to the turn raft to help prevent any predation happening on these eggs. The shelters also help with that as well. Um, and so what ends up happening is that the, these common turn rafts have actually been really successful. Like you saw in the video before, they are alive with turns during the spring and summer months. Um, and what uh, happens is that they're able to nest, they're able to lay eggs. And if we go to the next image, you'll see that those eggs are actually able to hatch. So um, there have been a few generations now of common terns that have migrated uh, north to Tommy Thompson Park in the spring, been able to lay eggs and hatch new chicks and then migrate south again um, in the fall. Now, this is a video that I took really recently, actually, a few days ago here in the Embayment D wetland. Um, and inside that fence, what you can see is some freshly planted um, aquatic plants. And so part of enhancing aquatic and terrestrial habitats is enhancing and improving the vegetative community. And so a big part of what our teams do here at Tommy Thompson Park is actually plant plants into the ground. And we can pause on this image here. Perfect. So you can see those were some of our staff members who are planting plants. And here we actually got some of our summer campers this summer to help us plant plants into the ground as well. Um, the plants that we're planting are specifically native plants. So my friends, you might have heard of this term native before. Um, native can refer to plants or animals or any other kind of living things that have existed in a certain place for a really long time. So if we're talking about Toronto, we're talking about plants and animals and other creatures that have lived here for a very long time. But the most important thing about native plants is how they benefit the other organisms that live in that space, whether it be other plants or um, other living things like animals. And so native plants in particular have these really wonderful interconnections with all of the other living things in the ecosystem where they live. Um, Raya showed you that clip of the monarch caterpillar earlier munching away on that leaf. That leaf is actually a part of the milkweed plant. And so we make sure that we have milkweed plants here growing at Tommy Thompson Park. Some of them grew naturally, which is fantastic. Some of them may have been planted by TRCA staff or by volunteers to ensure that we have habitat and resources available for monarch caterpillars or for monarch butterflies when they come to visit so that they can lay those eggs. So these are just a few examples of how we work to enhance the habitats here at Tommy Thompson Park. Another thing that we really try to do is to encourage the humans who are visiting this space to visit it in a respectful way. And so based on everything that we've shared with you so far in this live stream, I'm sure you're starting to realize, or maybe you already realized, what an incredible and biodiverse um, area Tommy Thompson Park has grown to be. And so at the entrance of Tommy Thompson Park, as you're walking in, you'll actually notice that we have a few signs in place and we have a few rules for folks who come to visit Tommy Thompson Park. So we can play that video now. Um, one of the signs that you can see is a no dogs allowed sign. And that sign is there um, to prevent people from bringing their dogs in. Because dogs are a domestic animal, when they're introduced to wildlife and wild animals, they can really disrupt them and affect um, their uh, life day to day. You can also see a no fire sign. And so you can imagine the kind of damage that could be caused by a fire if it was lit. Um, at our park and ended up accidentally spreading um, and damaging the communities that live here. And so while we are working to enhance the um, ecosystems here at Tommy Thompson Park, we're also making sure that people are coming out to see these ecosystems and connect with nature, but to do it in a respectful and responsible way. Um, and one of the ways to be respectful and responsible is by looking out for all creatures, both big and very, very small. And so Raya mentioned before the big multi-use road that stretches through Tommy Thompson Park. And often on this road, we can see many little creatures. Here we can see a decays brown snake slithering across the road. And maybe you can get a sense of how small that is when it passes beside 
this boot so tiny but we can also see many other creatures as well including a variety of caterpillars that call tommy thompson park home um, and so some of my favorite creatures here at the park are some of these tiniest uh tiniest ones um, and all of the different caterpillars that grow up to become different butterflies and moths that end up living here at Tommy Thompson Park. So special. We have talked about so much today in terms of how to visit Tommy Thompson Park, how uh, Tommy Thompson Park was created, and a little bit about the history. We've shared some of our favorite locations with you and some of the wildlife that live here. And we've talked about different interactions that take place here between living things and between humans and other living things as well. And now it is finally time to announce our quest. So I'm going <laughs> to pass it over to Raya to announce our final quest for all of you. Amazing. Thank you, Jasmine. And thanks for sharing about how we can help the park to be a sustainable space, like how we can sustain the park um, with the healthy ecosystems that are currently here, what things that we can do um, as we visit the park. Okay, we would love to have you visit the park. So this is part of it. Um, <laughs> coming out to Tommy Thompson Park, it's like you're leaving the city, even though you're still in the city. And um, we encourage everybody to come on out if you can on the weekends, bring your parents, families, friends, um, and come out for a lovely walk or a bike ride. And so when you come to the park, we actually have, we're setting up a quest for you. We've set it up already. And your quest is to find this lockbox, enter the code, and um, go through a couple of other steps. Now, you don't know what the code is, and we're not going to tell you what the code is here. What you're going to do to figure out the code for this lock case um, is come to Tommy Thompson Park, go to the Nature Center, which is about mm, five to ten minute walk in from the entrance. At the Nature Center, there is a map. So you can pull up the map, Sarah. Looks like what we've shown you throughout the live stream. And the Nature Center is circled there on the map. Sorry, I'm just noticing there's another blue jay so close. They're so cool looking. So find the Nature Center. And... On this, next to this map, there is kind of a sidebar that has some information about Tommy Thompson Park and what kinds of activities are great to do here. The things that Jasmine mentioned, the rules about the park are here as well. On the bottom, circled in that red square on the bottom uh, right there of your screen, there are some, inf there's some information about the trails here. And so we have pedestrian trails, we have the multi-use trail, and we have nature trails. And if we look at the next slide, you can see that these trails We've got the distance in kilometers of how long each of these trails are or how long they are um, if you add them all up together. The nature trail number that is hidden behind the star on your screen right now is the number of the first two digits of the secret code here for your quest. So if you enter those first two numbers um, onto the lockbox, that's um, the first part of that code. Now, to actually find the lockbox, because where is it going to be, Raya? This lockbox is going to be hidden by trail marker five. Again, you'll be looking at the map, find out where trail marker five, if it's not that far from the nature center, um, you'll be walking along the pedestrian trail, I'll give you that hint, walking along the pedestrian trail to get to trail marker five, find this, this locking case here, open it up, enter those first two digits that you got off the map, and the second two digits are this year. So 22. So the second, I just told you what the second two digits are, 2-2. Two, two. You have to come to the park to find the first two. Once you put in the four digits, there's a little, there it is. You flick this down, and it won't work right now because I don't have the right four digits there. But you flick this down, and the lock case opens up. And there is a QR code inside that you can scan. The reception is good enough closer to the entrance, so you should be able to do that there. You can scan the QR code. It takes you to um, a site for the final step of the quest. The first 10 people that have completed this quest will be sent a prize, a nature exploration prize. So something that will help you to explore this big, wide, amazing natural world that we exist in. So we encourage you to come to Diamond Thompson Park, take part in the quest. It'll be up for about a month. So until the end of October is when we'll have this, uh, this quest in place. After that, the lock case will, will not be there anymore. And um, yeah, come and check out the space. Go for a bike ride and just enjoy the surroundings that you are in. Now, 
Um, we are going to take some questions, if any have come up in the chat. But if you do need to go at this point, then we want to thank you so much for joining us today. And we encourage you to get outside, whether it's at Tommy Thompson Park or just in your own neighborhood. There's lots of um, lots of nature to explore right around where you live, whether you believe it or not, even cracks in the sidewalk if you got into the minutiae of it. And um, we do have a live stream coming up November 14th. So you can, this is for kindergarten classes. You can tell your younger siblings or teachers, you can tell your colleagues of primary grades that we will have a live stream um, about just after World Kindness Day. So about being kind to all kinds of different creatures. So we'll be talking about some other creatures we didn't talk about on today's live stream. But are there any questions, Sarah, that have come up in the chat? Or has it been so, fairly quiet today? The chat has been fairly quiet today, um, but I loved learning about TTP and learning about all the different things you all talked about um, in the different places at Tommy Thompson Park. But there are two questions from Catherine. So our first question is, are there coyotes at the park? Oh, good question. Yes. So we haven't talked too much about mammals. Jasmine mentioned, do you remember what she, who she mentioned? The mink, right? So the mink is one of the mammals who live at Tommy Thompson Park. There are um, meadow voles and field mice and groundhogs. And yes, indeed, there are coyotes. And whenever you discover that there is kind of a top predator, like a coyote, or in the case of aquatic ecosystems, um, maybe the northern pike, that's a kind of a species who's a top predator. Whenever there's a top predator in an ecosystem, that's an indicator that the ecosystem is able to support that animal, that predator. And so that's a really good sign. So the fact that coyotes have been living here for a very long time, there's a couple of coyote families sometimes, one closer to the entrance, one closer to the tip of the spit. And the fact that they've been living here for a long time really means that um, this... <laughs> Tommy Thompson Park or the Leslie Street Spit is successful in being able to sustain them and support them with all the other organisms who live here. And as we've talked about in this live stream, it's all connected. There's so many interactions within these ecosystems. Good question. Awesome. You mentioned there was another one. And our second... Yes, there was one more question from Catherine. Um, they asked, if we were to come to Tommy Thompson Park on a field trip this autumn, what would be the best thing to look out for? Ah, excellent. Yes. So um, on our Tommy Thompson Park website, tommythompsonpark.ca, uh, there is an education tab and you can find out about all kinds of field trips that we offer here and good things to look out for if you're on field trips. So being the fall, oh, such a, I mean, all year round is a great time to come. There are different types of organisms, different species who we might find in the winter. We don't see in the summer and things like that. So in the fall, the ones that are really visible are those animals who are Oh, I hope we get the word right. Ectothermic. Ectothermic? Yeah, they can't produce their own heat. So they need to get heat from outside. And the fall days get cooler and cooler. But on a bright, sunny day, think about these animals. Who might you encounter? Jasmine talked about snakes. So we sometimes see these snakes on the road on the multi-use trail more than we do in other seasons. We might see turtles basking more than other seasons when it's cold outside, but there's a sunshine that can help warm up their bodies. So keeping your eyes open for these, these animals who cannot produce their own body heat, who can't thermoregulate themselves. They need that external source of heat to warm up. Absolutely. And we are still in the fall migration season right now as well. So there are a number of birds that are making their way south and stopping by at Tommy Thompson Park. So Ryan mentioned the blue jays that she's been seeing around her, um, but there are a number of other really, really neat birds that you can keep your eyes peeled for as you visit. If you are getting really excited about Tommy Thompson Park and you want to spend more time there, we're also offering an urban nature club down at Tommy Thompson Park this fall. So you can find more information about that on the Tommy Thompson Park website. But that's a great opportunity to meet other youth like you who are interested in nature and get outside of Thompson Park and see all of the different wildlife that we've been talking about today. And so is that, is that, those are the two questions. Have any others come up in the meantime? Those are the only two questions for right now. Okay. So before we say goodbye, we noticed that um, you've been tuning in for a long time. So thank you very much. I think I have good enough reception here where I am to do a little pan so you can get a sense of the space. And as I turn over this way, there's that lockbox. It will not be hidden here. You can maybe see that there is Lake Ontario in the distance over there. I'm pointing at the opposite side from where Jasmine is. 
And then we can pan, you can see all this meadow space supporting all kinds of insects and those small mammals and then the coyotes who rely on them. And we can see that on this side, let's see if I can get it into the camera, we're getting into a bit more forested spaces here. And so um, there's, there are a lot of different ecosystems to check out. I just wanted to give you that bit of a 180 <laughs> of the space that we are in right now. Um, but it has been such a pleasure having you. And um, we thank you again for joining. And Jasmine, do you have any final words before we say goodbye? Thank you so much for tuning in. It's my favorite thing is talk air with you, why we love this unique wilderness. Um, and I encourage you all to get outside. Like Brian mentioned, if you can make your way down to Tommy Thompson Park and complete our quest, that would be fantastic. But even just getting outside this fall as the leaves start to change, as the weather starts to transition into cooler, cooler temperatures, it's a wonderful time to get outside and connect with nature. If you have questions and weren't able to put into the chat because you're watching this after the fact, then you can put them into the comments of the video, um, which will be at the same link as the original live stream was from. Um, so you can put them in the comments and we'll be checking every few days to see if there are questions in the comments as well. Thank you so much, everybody. And look up for the Blue Jays and look down for the critters and have a wonderful, wonderful Wednesday. Bye-bye.